The Reading Rockets Teleconference Series is a production of WETA in cooperation with the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, the National Education Association, the International Reading Association, and the National Association of Bilingual Education. Funding for this teleconference is provided by the United States Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs. Hello, I'm Delia Pompa. Welcome to this year's final show in the Reading Rockets teleconference series, Achieving Success in Reading. Today we're going to be talking about teaching English language learners to read. In classrooms across the country, teachers need to teach reading to children who don't speak English. But most of our teachers haven't been trained to do this. Today we have three independent researchers here to offer us guidance on instructing English language learners. Dr. Diane August is a senior research scientist for the Center for Applied Linguistics. Dr. Margarita Calderon is a senior research scientist at the Center for Research on the Education of Students Placed at Risk at Johns Hopkins University. And Dr. Fred Genesee is a professor in the psychology department at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. We are also joined by an audience of teachers, administrators, special education professionals, and parents. Later in the program, we will be taking questions from the audience and opening up the phone lines to viewers around the country and this time in Canada. Thank you all for joining us. Diane, why is teaching English language learners so hot these days? Well, I think it's a very hot topic for several reasons. First, there's been a dramatic increase in the number of English language learners in the United States, especially in the last um, 10 years or so. So I think lots of parts of the country that didn't have large numbers of English language learners before now are experiencing these children in their classrooms. So that's one issue. But the other is the No Child Left Behind Act has, um, is an act that has some very strong accountability provisions that require all children within the next, well, 12 years to reach standards in reading. And for the first time, the assessment data has to be disaggregated <coughs> by English um, language proficiency status. So schools are very aware now of the, the strengths and the academic weaknesses of their English language learners. The data is being disaggregated and schools are going to be held accountable for making sure that these children meet standards. Well, given that as a base, what do we know about the characteristics of these uh, learners that uh, might affect our work with them? Well, I think one very important thing to keep in mind is it's a very diverse population. That the label English language learner encompasses lots of different kinds of children. For example, although most of the children are in the elementary school level, there are substantial numbers of children both at the middle and secondary school levels. Although about 70% of children come from Spanish-speaking homes, there are also children from other first language backgrounds. But in addition, children come to school with very different um, literacy and language skills in their first language, which really impact learning to read in a second language. For example, some children come to school literate in their first language, and so the skills that they have in their first language can really transfer to literacy acquisition in their second language. Some kids come to school with very well-developed oral language proficiency in their first language, and again, this also impacts their ability to become literate in English. Um, children come to school with different levels of English oral language proficiency. Some children who are language minority and English learners have actually been born in the United States and raised in the United States. So they've been um, experienced in a context where English is spoken all around them. Other children come to the U.S. Um, and start school as soon as they arrive here. So they haven't mm -hmm. been in an English-speaking context. 
So there are many different factors that um, that discriminate these children. And I think it's a real mistake to think of sort of English language learners as one population of, of children. I know you've been doing a lot of work in vocabulary development in the second language. What role does that play in teaching these children to read as they acquire a second language? Well, vocabulary is really critical. And unfortunately, it really has been neglected. For example, in research, um, I'm a member of and principal investigator for a national literacy panel on language minority children and youth. And I can tell you since 1980, there have been three quasi-experimental studies that focus on helping English language learners develop vocabulary in English. I mean, this is quite amazing because vocabulary plays such a critical role in reading comprehension. Uh, children can manage with um, not knowing a few words in a text, but as soon as they really um, know more, don't know more than a few words, they really have issues with comprehending that text. Um, so vocabulary plays a very critical role in reading comprehension, and it's something that we need more research on, and it's something that we also need to explicitly teach. Is that research helping you find out what instructional practices work best with these children, and what would those be? Well, this is, again, a very... Um, a long answer. It's, it's a very broad <laughs> question. Um, as part of the National Literacy Panel, we have reviewed all the research on practices that work for English language learners. And the first thing I should tell you is that there are 18 studies in all that look at the development of component skills of literacy. When you compare this with the 400 studies that are cited in the National Reading Panel Report, you can see what a need we have for more research in this area. But I can tell you these um, 18 studies tell us that working on component skills of literacy is, is very important. And by the component skills of literacy, I mean things like phonological awareness, word reading, uh, fluency, vocabulary comprehension. It's very, very important to target these skills in English language learners. The other thing we found is that it's, you can really build on first language reading research, but you really have to make modifications in that research to make sure that the techniques work with English language learners. Many of the studies that, that we have located the practices build on effective practices for English language learners, but there are modifications in these practices to make sure that they are effective with English language learners. And if you want, I could give you a couple of examples. If you could just give us one, and then we, we really want to move on to what we need to do to make these work, but give us one example right now. Well, one example for if we're talking about vocabulary in the area of of comprehension. You can't just set an English language learner down with a chapter in a book or even three or four pages and expect them to read through these and understand. You really need to pre-teach some of the vocabulary. You need to scaffold the reading of this text with these children, asking them questions frequently to make sure that they understand what the text is about. Um, those are some examples. Diane, it seems like we know a lot about what it takes. Now, how do we, what do we need to do to implement these uh, pieces of research that we found and all the components of reading? Mm -hmm. Well, this is also a very complicated <laughs> question. We don't ask easy uh, ones Given here. the <laughs> amount of research we have in this area, I think it's very important to use research-based practices. So again, I think we really need a lot more good research in this area. Um, given that, I think professional development is extremely important. Teachers need to understand the theory that drives whatever intervention they're implementing. Um, I think having materials in the classroom is very, very important because quite frankly, I don't think professional development alone does it. I think teachers need something to work with. I think it's very important for teachers to pay attention to how whatever programs and practices they're using in the classroom work for these children. <coughs> Assessment is critical. You can't assume that because something is quote unquote research based, it's going to work for the children in your particular classroom. So teachers really need to attend to, is this working? 
and, and if it's not working, to really think about why um, it's not working and what they can do to make improvements in whatever strategies um, that they're using. So professional development, um, careful monitoring of student practice, and um, Fred, Diane's given us a lot of ideas about what teachers need to be doing and different approaches and, and the whole panoply of solutions teachers need to look at. Are there advantages or risks to different approaches that teachers should know about? Yes, I guess I would have to say yes. It, it's hard to answer this without a specific approach in mind, but it, it, in, a, in effect, I think good teachers need to have a repertoire of instructional strategies to use with English language learners. And I think this is true f for teachers working with native English speakers, for that matter. It's particularly true for teachers wor working with English language learners because, as Diane pointed out, these uh, the children come to school with very different cultural backgrounds, very different first language skills, and even a very different levels of uh, literacy ability in the first or second language. And teachers need to be able to tailor their instruction to respond to those individual needs. And uh, there's another feature of uh, working with these children which uh, classroom teachers working with English native English speakers don't uh, have to face, and that is English language learners can come into the classroom at any grade level. Mm -hmm. So children can immigrate to the U.S. and begin schooling in the U.S. in grade five, grade six, in middle school, in secondary school, and some of these uh, children uh, present a particular challenge which calls for um, specific kinds of instructional strategies. Is there reliable research that tells us about how children learn to read in a second language and what might be some of that research that teachers would need to know about how children learn to read in a second language? Well, the, the National Literacy Panel, which Diane referred to, is uh, really the first serious attempt to look at what the research uh, is saying in a very, very comprehensive way. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that's driving this um, panel's work is the question as to whether reading in a second language is the same as reading in a, sec in a first language, and if there are differences, how do we respond to those differences? <clears throat> so it would, be pr it would probably be premature for me to say on behalf of the panel what the findings are, but it's, m it's my sense, it would be interesting to see what Diane says. As a researcher. <laughs> that there, there's a lot of evidence, that, convergent evidence, that suggests that learning to read in a second language is very similar to reading in a first language insofar as the underlying language and cognitive processes are involved. So the same component skills that are mm -hmm. important in first language learning, like phonological awareness, the ability to name letters, the ability, vocabulary knowledge, how you use uh, context to figure out the meanings of words. These are all foundation skills that children need, whether it's in, they're reading in a first language or a second language. Um, but you always have to filter these, what might be regarded as kind of almost universal processes of language acquisition, reading acquisition, through the filters that these kids bring, which, which are their cultural and linguistic differences. Moving on from that, Margarita, lots of people have a curiosity, be a curiosity about the role of the native language. What role does that play in, in a student's learning to read in a second language? Uh, again, going back to the preliminary findings of the panel, uh, it plays a major role. Uh, reading, learning to read in the primary language definitely helps students um, learn to read in the second language. Um, but Again, it depends on how well a program is structured and the development of a program as well as a very solid research-based transition into English reading is what is critical. Uh, I think that is one of the biggest um, uh, hurdles that we need to deal with in schools. How do we develop reading in the primary language so that it is very effective, very comprehensive, and it's very much what they have mentioned already. It's all the different components. Even reading in Spanish, for an example, has to have a lot of uh, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, word knowledge, everything that Diane mentioned about uh, vocabulary learning. 
if it doesn't take place in the primary language, it's going to be very difficult for the children to transfer a lot of concepts and word knowledge into English reading. Well, do we know what aspects of learning to read in a, in a first language carry over into the second language? Mm -hmm. um, Diane, you, you, yeah, you look like you have an answer. <laughs> well, we're doing a lot of research funded through the National Institutes for Child Health and Development and the Institutes for Educational Sciences, the Office of English Language Acquisition. We've done a longitudinal study following kids from the end of second grade through the end of fifth grade, looking at um, children who were instructed first in their native language, which happened to be Spanish, um, and then moved into English-only instruction to examine what components transferred from the first to the second language. And what we found is regardless of whether the kids were instructed in English or Spanish, phonological awareness skills transfer from the first to the second language. However, for skills like word reading and uh, comprehension to transfer from the first to the second language, children need to be instructed in Spanish first. So instruction, language of instruction, plays a major role in transfer. So even though all these children were from Spanish-speaking homes, um, children had to be instructed first in Spanish for these skills to transfer. But I also wanted to say something um, in response to one of your previous questions about um, issues related to implementing effective programs and practices for English language learners. And I think that we can't forget how important resources are in making sure we have sound programs for these children. And I say that because Children entering kindergarten, very limited English proficient, from poor families, for example, really need a lot of support to master English literacy. They need extra time in school. They need to be with a teacher who really is well trained so that they know how to scaffold instruction. They need to be in a small enough group so the teacher can respond to the needs of these children, and this we will not have unless we have sufficient resources. It's not just a matter of research. You know, this segment uh, has had lots of interest. Uh, not to put you all on the spot or anything, but uh, teachers were waiting for this particular uh, segment. And one question we had was, how often should a teacher correct the second language mistakes a student makes? And, and how does that fit into instruction and in reading? Well, this is, a, uh, this is a question that comes up frequently in all forms of second language education, whether it's in a bilingual program, an immersion program for English-speaking children, and, and certainly when you're teaching literacy. And it, it, historically, it's interesting, we've come, we're coming out of a period when I think a lot of people believe that we shouldn't provide correction. But we're now uh, going into a period when I, thinking is changing a little, uh, to the point where people believe that um, at, at certain times, correction is appropriate. Uh, because there are certain technical aspects of the language. Spelling is a very good example, but also vocabulary is another. Um, how you organize text for a science report or a narrative, these are all, uh, this is all knowledge which is in many cases actually acquired more easily if you're told explicitly what it, how to do it and if you're corrected when you don't do it uh, correctly. So uh, I think that if correction is, has a goal in mind, and it's also done in, a, in the broader context of literacy, then it can be very effective, in fact. But obviously, one has to use it judiciously because if you overcorrect, then you're just going to turn students off. Another topic that people have a lot of questions about are children with learning disabilities, children who are learning a second language. Are there spe special considerations for these English language learners who also have a disability? Well, I can say that I think you have to be really careful before you label a child as learning disabled. I think that the child needs to be provided with really sound, effective instruction and monitored carefully because a lot of children who are labeled learning disabled have not been instructed properly. So I think it's very important to discriminate between those children who have not received proper instruction and those children who really have a learning disability. Yes, and the, the term, uh, if I could just add, the term learning uh, disabled or learning disabilities is I, a term I think that is really overused. Uh, and you see this not only in schools themselves, but you see it in the research literature that often researchers will distinguish between normal or typical children and children with learning disabilities. 
it's probably the case so that this is a, a very heterogeneous group of children. And I can think of at least three different groups within this larger group. And, it, and it's, I think it's important to distinguish <coughs> among these groups. So you, you can have children who are having trouble learning because they have language impairment. You could have children who have trouble learning because they actually have a reading disability. Or you can uh, have trouble who are learning, uh, having difficulty learning because they actually have uh, cognitive or intellectual problems. And uh, before you can actually work with these children effectively, uh, you have to actually make a correct sort of assessment of what their particular well, needs are. Acknowledging the difficulty in uh, diagnosing these children, what special considerations would you have to consider, would you have to take into account once you start actually knowing what the, the, what the issues the children face are and, and what would you do in the classroom? Well, if it's a child with, I'll, I'll start the ball rolling and see if others have something to contribute. <laughs> if you have a child who seems to have a language impairment, that is, the child has trouble learning language, this would, first of all, this would show itself by the child having difficulty both in the first language and in the second language. <clears throat> then, first of all, it's, it's important to realize that these children are capable of learning uh, a second language within the limits that they, they have. In other words, being lang uh, language impaired doesn't mean you can't learn a second language to a high level of proficiency, but there are going to be limits. And so you want to give these kinds of children um, particular attention. You need to individualize their instruction to give them more enrichment, to give them opportunities to practice the language more, and so on. But otherwise, within that, children with language impairment should be getting the same kind of programming and instruction as other children. They should, they, they should not be given less because they really need more. And by giving them less, we're actually making their impairment a reality. Yeah, and one real issue is that um, when people see a child that's an English language learner, they tend not to diagnose them as learning disabled. <coughs> and so diagnosis, proper diagnosis is important, but s so are services for this population of students. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's particularly important for older uh, English language learners children that are coming into the upper elementary grades or the middle school or even the high school. Uh, they're labeled learning disabled too early without looking into their background mm -hmm. and see what, what are some of the gaps in either vocabulary or, or some of the basic reading skills. So it's important to have a very thorough process for diagnosing those three areas that, that Fred mentioned. Otherwise, they may be either placed too quickly into a category or not placed at all. So many things to think about. But right now, let's meet KB Lee. He's a kindergarten teacher in California who has the task of teaching children who speak several different languages. Let's watch as he skillfully mixes serious instruction with lively play to introduce these children to new letters and sounds. The Mark Hopkins School is located at the center of Sacramento's large Hmong community. K.B. Lee has been teaching here since 1996. One of the reasons I chose Mark Hopkins to come and work at is because of the diversity in the community. We have uh, English-speaking uh, students, we have Hmong students, we have Spanish students, we have Hindi students, Tongan. Uh, it's like just like a bowl of salad, you know, we have everything mixed together. With so many of his kindergartners speaking foreign languages at home, Mr. Lee must work extra hard to teach reading in English. We need Leo to help us. Good job, you ready? Leo's coming. Leo's looking to see who's ready. Now, Leo has a problem. He wants to say a word, but he keeps forgetting a sound, a sound at the end. Now, Leo wants some ice cream, but Leo cannot say the word ice cream. He forgets a sound. Watch. Experts say that kindergarten teachers should help their students achieve phonemic awareness, the realization that within a word are individual sounds or phonemes. I want to sing about ice cream. What sound did he forget? Very good. Let's try the next one. Another word. The stars so bright. The stars so bright. The stars so bright. Being able to hear the sounds inside a word is just one step down the path to reading. A big glass of milk. 
What's the sound? A child must also learn which letters go with which sounds. Phonics, in other words. All right, let's see who's ready. We're going to do our letters, pictures, and sound. Ready? Letter. T. Picture. Timer. Sound. Even in kindergarten, an important ingredient of any reading program is assessment. We don't want to start a program in September and wait till June to get a sense for whether or not we're successful. We want to start in September. We want to see how we're doing in the middle of September, at the end of the September, the beginning of November. Every month we want to have some sense of whether or not the investment we're making, the interventions we're using, are effective for kids. We can't do that without progress monitoring systems. Samuel, show me the front of the book. Mr. Lee regularly measures each student's progress. Today, it's Samuel's turn. Show me the title of the book. Good. I will show you letters. You tell me the name of the letter, okay? This one. T. T. Good. J. Good. How about this one. Right now, he's still very low uh, in terms of reading. H. Letter recognition. Listen. Door. Floor. Sound the same? Good. But he should come up. How about mix shoes? Hearing a rhyme requires phonemic awareness. These quick tests will tell Mr. Lee which skills each child needs to boost. Reading coaches will offer one-on-one -on -one help to the bottom fifth of students. Can you write your first name, last name for Mr. Lee? Okay, right here. Most of my students, in fact, almost all of my students, at the beginning of the year, they don't know anything. And towards the end of the year, I have this feeling that I've done something good with them. You know, they just blossom. Good. Keep going. Even those who don't speak English. So I feel real good about that. Very good, Samuel. K.B. Lee is leading his students on one of the most important journeys of their lives. And if you want to be on my train... You have to tell me a word that starts with the letter S. Mr. Lee's last stop today is bringing together phonemic awareness and letter sound correspondences. Socks. Good. Get on the train. Get on the train. Almost all of Mr. Lee's kids are on track for becoming readers. Yeah. What sound? Well, help me. Did you know we have a website designed especially for Spanish-speaking parents and educators? ColorinColorado.org is a place where educators and teachers can find the best information for teaching English language learners to read. We'd like to remind you that we will be taking your call shortly. Our toll-free number is 1-888-493-9382. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us for this Reading Rockets teleconference. With us in the WETA studio in Washington, D.C., are panelists Dr. Diane August, Dr. Margarita Calderon, and Dr. Fred Genesee. We are also joined by an audience of teachers, administrators, special education professionals, and parents. Dr. Margarita Calderon is a senior research scientist at the Center for Research on the Education of Students Placed at Risk at Johns Hopkins University, a long title. Margarita, I'm sure you've seen many cl classrooms like the one we just saw. What teacher preparation uh, and knowledge is required to ensure success in these kinds of classrooms? Extensive <coughs> teacher preparation. Um, a lot of staff development days, but also follow up in the classroom. Uh, teachers who are learning to combine not just uh, effective reading practices but also second language teaching and learning practices uh, need a lot of extensive practice themselves. They need to see some demonstrations in the classroom. They need support afterwards to make sure that they're doing this uh, 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 accordingly and what we noticed in this videotape is that uh, this teacher was also doing some very meticulous assessment so it's not just a matter of learning strategies teaching strategies 
but also learning uh, the implications from assessment, learning how to improve their practice continuously and to adapt it to the children, uh, the population that they have. Uh, this was a wonderful example of a kindergarten classroom, but if we think about middle school children, immigrant children, newcomers, who are also in need of phonemic awareness, you wouldn't do a train or you wouldn't uh, uh, have a puppet, but rather a teacher would need to be very sensitive as to how to go about teaching phonemic awareness, which will be critical to decoding to, to um, word knowledge, fluency, comprehension, and everything that goes along with, with the rest of the reading train. And so for that, middle school teachers, high school teachers, are perhaps the ones most in need of extensive staff development practices, very comprehensive programs where um, they're learning something that perhaps they never had in their teacher preparation programs. Well, how do we train all these teachers across all the levels? What are the vehicles that we can use to train them? Um, differentiated staff development, definitely. Uh, for elementary teachers, uh, programs that uh, demonstrate and use approaches for elementary, for middle school, for high school, uh, differentiated staff development. But staff development is not just uh, the little bag of tricks for Monday morning, but rather, what does the research base say? Uh, what is the theory behind these practices? Uh, teachers need to internalize the rationale, the purpose for doing something versus another. Uh, like Fred said, there's, there's been some myths and perhaps some things that uh, we've done in the past but as we grow more knowledgeable about the field, then we need to bring these practices into the classroom. And uh, teachers cannot teach what they haven't been taught. And it's a matter of now doing massive staff development in all the schools at all levels because every teacher is new to what we're talking about here, every single teacher. ESL teachers need to learn more about reading. Reading teachers need to know about second language practices. Bilingual teachers um, need to learn how to incorporate everything that we've learned into teaching Spanish or whatever the primary language is. And so it's massive training all around. Well, let's say we had a magic wand and all the teachers were trained already. Once you have that situation taken care of, how do schools find the best strategies then that teachers can implement in, in working with English language learners? I, I can think of one example, which is, um, I think, a, a wonderful example of a school district where the superintendent uh, organized uh, learning communities. The superintendent staff is doing a lot of research themselves. They had to look for the appropriate approaches that would best meet their schools and the principals are involved. And so they have set up learning, small learning communities throughout the district and into the schools for continuous study. Uh, they're discovering what works, what might not work. And so um, this, this terrific school district in, in Kauai, of all places, uh, has uh, really approached learning about second language uh, learners through their own particular study. And in that inquiry discovery process, uh, that's where everything begins to fall into place. But everyone has to be involved, the principals. We cannot leave this for teachers alone. It, it's no longer just something that a teacher can do, but rather what is the whole district doing? What, what are the administrators learning? So it's a mission of self-discovery, it sounds like. What advice do you have for rural schools who might just be starting to serve English language learners, and maybe they have a few? What mm -hmm. advice do you have regarding teacher training or strategies to use? Uh, a comprehensive reading program, of course, but there's also, we've learned a lot about uh, second language learning, uh, sheltered instruction, which I think Fred can talk about this a little bit more. But there are some very specific strategies that mainstream teachers can use in their classroom when they have a few students. Uh, and it's, 
it helps all the students. It, it's not just those two or three, but rather through these instructional approaches with a lot of um, hands-on examples, then uh, all children learn. All children are able to master it, as well as those few students. Let's turn to the Spanish-speaking population. As you know, they make up almost 80 percent of the uh, English language learners in this country. Um, Diane, for those children whose first language is Spanish, are there particular approaches that might be useful? Well, I think that for children whose first language is Spanish and who are literate in Spanish, um, a very important thing is to make children aware that they have a lot of word knowledge in their first language that they can transfer to their second language. That is, there are many words called cognates where the meaning of the word is the same and the way the word looks is the same from, say, Spanish to English. It's um, helping kids take advantage of all this knowledge that they have in their first language and apply it to their second language would be an important thing to do. And I think people don't realize how many cognates there are between um, Spanish and English. One third of all English words are cognates with Spanish. We're talking about from 10,000 to 15,000 words. And what's even more interesting is many of these words are low frequency words in English. So they're words that people would consider like SAT type words. Um, high level words. Yeah, but they're very low frequency, uh, high frequency words in Spanish that people use every day. Um, we're working on an intervention right now funded through the National Institutes for Child Health and Development that um, is intended to help children who are literate in Spanish, who are limited English proficient, transfer their um, knowledge from their first to their second language, make them aware that they have this rich base that they can build on. So again, this is research funded by NICHD and the Institute for Educational Sciences, intended to help kids build on this cognate knowledge. Mm -hmm. And along the lines of the teacher development process, what we're finding in the NICHD and some of the other studies is that uh, teachers need to be very deliberate in pointing out what is a cognate. Sometimes the, the, even the, the youngest children have difficulty figuring out that president and presidente are cognates. And so when the teacher knowledge is there and when the teacher can uh, explicitly point out some uh, very simple things such as that or that there are differences in the way we pronounce the R in English and the R in Spanish, uh, those are the tiny little subtleties that are important to, for teachers to also have and to know so that they can help the children make their transition and capitalize on, uh, on their primary language through, through all this. And Correct. the research shows that <coughs> uh, it's English language learners who are good readers in both Spanish and, and in English um, use the same strategies and have a conscious awareness of these uh, transfer effects and these mm -hmm. cross-linguistic relationships. Whereas it's interesting, students who are poor English language learners and also poor uh, readers in Spanish, they don't see connections between the language. They don't see those connections in the oral language and they don't see them in the written language. Uh, but if you actually uh, provide interventions which help these students to see these connections, then they actually start to benefit from them. Yeah, and I, I could add that um, to understand what one's reading, one really needs an understanding of the concepts that are embedded in the print. And so it's not just a matter of being able to decode the words in English or have the English label. One has to really understand what, what one is reading. And this kind of conceptual knowledge, this background knowledge, this content knowledge, is knowledge that can easily be developed in children's first languages. I mean, therein lays a lot of value in providing children content knowledge in their native language as they're acquiring proficiency in English. Because without this background knowledge, this content knowledge, 
even with being able to decode the words or understand what the you know words mean in sort of pieces, you can't sort of put the picture together. It's but important. It, I'm sorry. No, go right it's ahead. It's a, but it's just building it's on really what Diane important. is saying is that. It, it, when you know when we work with native English speakers t teaching them to read, we always uh, we assume that we need to start with what they know as a jumping off point. So we embed um, literacy instruction in the experiences that these children bring to school with them. And um, I think that we need to be very consciously aware of doing that with English language learners as well. They, are, they will not have the same kind of experiences that native English speakers will have, although one has to be careful here because, as Diane pointed out, some English language learners actually do have similar experiences. But by and large, the teacher needs to try and connect with the students on the level of their experiences so that they're, like the teacher we saw in the video, he should be introducing words to them that they're likely to know already and then he's helping them to break those words down that, into science. That raises a, an interesting point that some of our viewers might be um, have asked. Are there environmental factors that uh, might affect some native Spanish speakers' ability to read, write uh, uh, in, in English uh, that affect Spanish speakers as a group, perhaps? Environmental influences? Environmental factors like poverty or level of education of parents or, or mm -hmm. those kinds of factors. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, it, the research is quite clear in showing that, uh, first of all, if children come to school and they're already literate in their first language, that, and most teachers will tell you this, that it's much easier to teach them reading and writing in English. And this is particularly evident if you've got children who immigrate from, say, Mexico, and they, they've been in a, a solid a school, say, in Mexico, they're, they're nine or ten years of age, they come to a, a school in the U.S., if they can read in Spanish, then teaching them to read in English is quite straightforward. But some children who have been born and raised in the U.S., but they've grown up in a Spanish-speaking home, they may actually have some literacy experiences from the home, and that will definitely help. But other children don't have the benefit of that kind of literacy experience. Many of these children will have grown up in families where the parents themselves may not be literate. Or the parents may be literate, but they may be so busy earning a living that they're not sharing those literacy experiences uh, with their children, and so the children don't bring those benefits to school with them. And it, so it can be useful for teachers to know what's going on in the family. Mm -hmm. um, it also goes back a little bit to this disability issue that you know, a child may look like uh, the child has a reading disability, but it may be that there's been a very impoverished literacy uh, background for that child. Mm -hmm. Well, it also it. argues for while children are acquiring literacy in English, giving them in school, providing them with access to content in their native language as a way to help them develop the content knowledge that, that they need to make sense of the English they're reading. I mean, I'm quite concerned, actually, about some aspects of the No Child Left Behind Act, because I think if one focuses just on um, discrete skills in reading, for example, and reading narrative text and math, and the kids don't have an opportunity to learn content in other subjects, it's going to really impact their ability to comprehend what they're reading. So, again, the importance of providing children access to rich content in a language in which sort of they understand the content. Now, don't get me wrong, I think it's very important to provide these children with the skills they need to become literate in English. And I don't propose that we wait a long time to do this. I think one needs to provide systematic instruction in English reading from a fairly early age and really build these kids' um, um, ability to access um, English content that's critically important. Margarita, you read. Yeah, I was, I was going to add uh, that it's also very important if the children are starting out to read in, in the primary language or let's say in Spanish, that they're in this program long enough to build those comprehension, uh, com uh, reading comprehension skills and other skills that um, if they're going to transfer, then they have to be developed. I think what happens too often is that they only get a small dose of decoding and the rest of the, the most important reading skills get left out of a primary language instruction program. Therefore, when the children are transferred into English reading, they're expected to have all of, of the other skills, and, and maybe they don't because they weren't there long enough to develop those. 
Uh, but I agree with Diane that unless the English is being developed also systematically from an early stage, we may wind up with children who um, um, many schools think that they don't, are not able to transition until the fourth, fifth grades, and that is a little late. When the children come to the middle schools, it's very difficult for them to, to pick up all those dense text and be able to read and tackle the content because their reading in English isn't developed as far as it should be. So connections between what happens in the home and what happens previous to school are very important beginning in the early childhood. Let's meet a scientist now who's been studying infants' amazing ability to distinguish the subtle differences between speech sounds. Tenait en son bec un fromage. Maître Renard, par l'odeur alléchée, lui teint à peu près ce langage. Jing Ye Si, Li Bai, Chuang Qian Ming Yue Guang, Yi Shi Di Shang Shuang, Ju Tou Wang Ming Yue. The human voice can produce at least 150 different speech sounds or phonemes. English uses only 40 or so of these sounds. Thanks again, Warren, for coming in. We really appreciate it. Psychologist Dr. Janet Worker wants to know how babies learn to distinguish speech sounds of their native language. Babies, just like adults, are interested in new information. So when they hear something that's different from what they've been hearing before, their interest perks up. And you can measure that in a number of ways. You can measure it through their sucking pattern or through their looking time or even through something like a head turn. Worker trains babies to turn their heads whenever they hear a change in sound by rewarding them with a view of a musical bunny. Soon, babies are turning their heads the moment they hear a change, anticipating the bunny. Headphones prevent the adults from hearing the speech sounds and accidentally cueing the baby. Hey Shane, are you ready? Worker can now find out if this six-month-old can hear the difference between two English sounds. She keeps the baby engaged until phonemes are played over a speaker. Da. 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 Ba. This baby can hear the difference between B and D. In fact, even newborns can tell them apart. Look, Shane, look! Next, Worker tests the baby with another pair of sounds. The phoneme will change from one kind of D to another. The two sound distinct to speakers of Hindi, but adults who only speak English can't hear the difference. Da. 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 The baby hears the difference between the two sounds, one of which she's never heard before. By the age of 10 to 12 months, infants not regularly exposed to Hindi lose the ability to distinguish these sounds. Da. Da. Twelve-month-old babies have already become specialists in their native language. We now know that even in very young children, the ability to hear language is highly developed. For parents of future readers, workers' research contains an important message. As a parent, when you're talking to your infant, you're not only having a wonderful time and setting up a great emotional relationship, but you might also be providing them with essential information for them to become accomplished readers some several years later. Nobody wants to give up on a struggling reader. Now, nobody has to. Whether you're an educator or parent, or someone who just cares about kids, check out readingrockets.org, the definitive resource for teaching kids to read. It's another great production of WETA, Washington, D.C. We'd like to remind you that we will be taking your call shortly. Our toll-free number is 1-888-493-9382. Welcome back, and thank you once again for joining the Re Reading Rockets teleconference. We'll be taking your calls shortly. 
Dr. Fred Genesee is a professor of psychology at McGill University. He's done extensive work in the area of total immersion and simultaneous acquisition of two languages. Fred, let's take a few steps back. Can these students really learn to read in English if they can't speak the language? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I, I, there's certainly a lot of progress you can make with um, English language learners before they're proficient in the oral language. So you can uh, lay the foundations for later literacy. We focused a lot up till now on, on phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, early vocabulary development, uh, teaching children the names of letters and so on, and the correspondence between uh, how a letter looks and how a sound corresponds to that letter. Those are skills that actually can be taught before children have uh, very high levels of oral proficiency. Um, I think it's important though that, and, and most good teachers know this because I think most good teachers start with those kinds of uh, skills early on, but at the same time uh, they need to be laying the foundations for more advanced levels of kind of reading. So um, as, as the children get older, these kinds of foundational skills will not be enough. They'll need to be able to uh, understand words in context. They'll be able, they have to understand complex grammatical structures. Those kinds of reading skills, the more advanced ones, do require more advanced levels of language proficiency. But in the beginning, you can make quite a bit of progress in teaching reading. And in fact, reading can be the basis for oral language development. So what can teachers take away from that for reading instruction, for their practice? Well, I think uh, my opinion would be that there's two things. One is that they need to uh, start small, start on the small pieces, uh, even from the very beginning, but at this, and then the other one is though. But at the same time, there should always be this background of uh, more contextualized reading and writing. So as you're focusing on the small pieces, embed that in um, uh, reading and writing activities, which are probably beyond the students at that point, but they will become uh, important later on. It's really what I was saying before. The, the, the task of teaching reading is complex because teachers really need to be doing several things all at the same time, but what they're focusing on at any given uh, point is going to depend upon what stage the learner is at. You've focused much of your work over the, the last several years on language acquisition. Um, I'm wondering, can you tell our audience how or different ways a child might acquire a second language? I, they can, there's lots of ways they can acquire language. In fact, I would say that especially young language learners, like the children in this uh, videotape, preschool children especially, but even early uh, school age children, can't help but learn language. It's almost impossible to stop, to prevent a child from learning language. So it's sort of interesting to reflect on how much difficulty we have teaching them language. Uh, but children certainly learn a lot of language from one another. And at some point, uh, it's very, very important that English language learners have contact with other native speakers, but native speakers of English who are the same age. Mm -hmm. um, and that will help them acquire the kinds of social language skills they need for social interaction and social survival in a sense. At the same time, exposure to the language of native speakers is really not enough. They really need to be exposed to more mature language learners, like teachers or older students, who can provide models of a literate language. And by literate language, I don't mean just the ability to read and write, but I mean the ability to use oral language in ways that are like literacy. Because it's really that kind of oral language proficiency that ultimately is very important in academic settings. We really, we really have to take uh, English language learners, and native speakers of English for that matter, uh, from where they start, which is with social proficiency, uh, proficiency in social uses of language, to proficiency in the uses of language for, uh, for academic purposes. Does the way a child learns a second language have an impact on how successful a reader or how successful he is in academic achievement to turn out? Well, I think that children, there's no doubt that uh, uh, children who learn a second language such as English uh, ex uh, to a high degree before they come to school, these children will definitely have an advantage in learning to read and write in English. Um, but. It, that's not enough. They, they need to be taken beyond these social uses of language to the use of language for reading, for writing, for talking about abstract, uh, complex material. So children who have learned English as a second language not only extensively, but in the context of talking about complex ideas or making an argument for or against something, uh, these children will have an additional advantage because they're already beginning to learn some really critical components of literacy. 
Now, the question you must get 25 times a week. How long does it take an immigrant child to learn English? Well, um, depends on what kind of English language proficiency you're talking about. Um, one of the things that I think we have learned about language is that it's not a single thing. There, when To say somebody's proficient in a language, uh, you really need to qualify it by saying they're proficient in using languages in what ways. Uh, virtually all children become um, can become highly proficient in the oral uses of uh, English. Um, and they can do this relatively quickly, uh, but not as quickly as we think. One of the myths about English language learning is that children soak up English like a sponge and that it sort of happens overnight. But this is not true, in fact. It can take... There's a study uh, of a colleague of mine in Edmonton, uh, Alberta, in Canada, where she's looking at young English language learners in that province. They're surrounded by English, other English-speaking children. She's looking at their oral English language development. And even after two years of exposure with, uh, with these other children, they still have not mastered basic grammatical rules of the language. They're still making mistakes with tense, with pronoun use, and so on. They're highly communicative, these children. But it's not because their language is so advanced, it's because they've developed strategies for communicating which don't rely just on oral language. The situation becomes even more complicated when you ask the question, well, how long does it take children to learn the language skills they need to do well in school? Well, there's a lot of evidence that suggests it can take anywhere between five and seven years. So if you monitor the language proficiency of English language learners on things like reading tests, you will find that they don't start to score at the level of native speakers often until they're in grades five, six, or seven. And one of the reasons for that is that the language that is important in schooling is not entirely natural. It's something you have to learn and it's something you have to be taught. So it takes longer than learning language simply for social communication. Margarita, um, it seems like we know an awful lot about how we learn language, how kids learn to read, but there seem to be lots of misconceptions still floating around out there. What are the ones you run into when you're working with teachers in schools? About uh, children learning to read? Mm -hmm. English language learners learning it, to read. What misconceptions do people continue to have? I think one of those is that um, it's just some, some really basic uh, uh, phonics uh, and not, um, not a comprehensive program. Uh, that's one thing. But the other th misconception that we hear is that children cannot learn to read in two languages simultaneously. And uh, we've looked at some uh, studies uh, through, the, through the panel and also through some of our CRESPAR studies where children are learning to read in the, what we call 50-50 programs or paired programs where they learn both languages. Um, now, these programs are very carefully orchestrated so that the teachers are, are, are addressing all the different issues of the two language structures. When a program is very well developed, then um, we see the results, the longitudinal results have shown that the children in the 50-50 programs in comparison to transitional and to the average district um, achievement in reading uh, have done extensively better. But when you stop and analyze the programs, the staff development process that went in, uh, all of these factors contribute to saying, yes, children can be very successful learning to read in two languages. And I think many of us did the same thing. I think there's a lot of us walking around out there in the world that, that experienced this. Uh, but unless it's very carefully orchestrated, then it is going to take a little bit longer. Yeah. Fred, you're the resident Canadian expert today. We've all heard so much about the Canadian immersion model, and, and people have tried to export it. Can you tell us how the Canadian immersion model worked, and then what happened in the United States when we tried to implement it, and what was different? And Diane, I'd love for you to jump in there, too, because I know you have some experience with this. Well, this is an interesting phenomenon, because... Uh, the word immersion is being used in very, uh, very different ways in Canada and the U.S., and I'm, so I'm going to give some definitions. Uh, uh, in Canada, the word immersion is used to teach French as a second language to native English-speaking children. And these were programs that were initiated almost 40 years ago now. It really is part of Canada's official policy on bilingualism. So they were, uh, they were programs that were designed to help young English-speaking children to learn Canada's other official language. So these are children who already speak the dominant language of the community. And it, uh, we all know that this is also 
one of the dominant languages in the world. These also were children who had all the advantages of growing up in families where the parents were literate and, and used literacy a lot. These programs were highly successful. Then what happened was they were actually introduced to the, in the U.S. shortly after and they were introduced in the U.S. in the same way that they had been created in Canada. That is, they were, they were made available to English-speaking American children uh, say Spanish immersion. The first immersion programs in the U.S., in fact, were Spanish immersion programs in Southern California for English-speaking children. And they were, again, very successful. The results were very similar to what we had in Canada. But then what started to happen is that the term immersion started to be used for teaching English to uh, Spanish-speaking children, for example. So the notion of immersion got transformed in a way which really was not true to its origins in Canada. So now immersion is ref in the U.S. refers to English immersion for Spanish-speaking children. And as a result of that form of immersion, you really can't use the, the Canadian uh, results on immersion in any way to inform you about immersion for Spanish-speaking children because these are two entirely different populations of children. In Canada, these are children who speak the majority language. In the U.S., these are children who speak a minority language. Diane, want to add anything to well, that? Well, I was going to add something actually on this issue of the acquisition of English proficiency and issues around that acquisition. As we were talking about before, I think it's very important to take individual difference factors into account when we discuss this. Um, one of the things that the research studies find is that you need a certain amount of English proficiency to sort of bootstrap yourself to the point where you can take advantage of the instruction provided you. So that children who enter schools as English language learners who are below that threshold of English proficiency are going to have a lot harder time taking advantage of the English context around them to acquire additional proficiency. And this again has implications for the kind of scaffolding and additional instruction given to these children who enter U.S. schools with fairly limited English proficiency. Now, at the same time, the other thing I think we have learned about second language learning is that language learning actually occurs uh, most effectively when the students are not focusing on language learning. So that uh, in the immersion programs, for example, in Canada, we've learned that children actually can learn a lot of new academic knowledge or new cognitive skills through the, through the medium of a language that they don't master yet. And in fact, by focusing the student's attention on, on learning other kinds of skills or knowledge, you actually can facilitate uh, second language acquisition. So in the case of English language learners, even though we know that it actually takes time to learn these oral language skills or these academic language skills, we shouldn't be misled to think that we have to wait till they've mastered those skills to teach them content, to teach them new academic skills. That at some point, as Diane says, they need basic oral language skills, but then you move, I think you move fairly quickly into teaching them new, new knowledge, new skills um, through the medium of the language, and you have to provide scaffolding to do that, but you ca we can't wait five or six years to teach them math and science. And we don't have to because we know that if we start teaching them math and science before they've mastered English, we're also going to facilitate their English language development. If we do it, as, as, as Margarita said, if we do it in a very careful and thoughtful way. Well, it seems like there's been lots of room, Margarita, for error in, in our school system and in our instructional systems for perhaps not using the correct strategies for students. So what are some strategies we might use now that some of these things have happened to motivate uh, English language learners to learn to read while they're learning to read in a second language. Uh, high interest uh, activities in the content areas. Uh, science is such a, a wonderful um, a way of uh, engaging students in projects where they don't need that much oral language, where they can begin to be exposed to um, a lot of rich content and more vocabulary. Uh, this is also where there's a lot of cognates, so they can uh, teachers can capitalize on cognates and use those as a bridge to develop more English proficiency. Uh, even social studies. Uh, even social studies um, teachers are, are learning ways to introduce different concepts to students who, who are very limited. Uh, I think if the focus is too much on language, on, on the learning the technicalities of language, especially for the older students, 
uh, that may not be as, as helpful and successful in motivating as it would when they know that they're learning something, that they're learning content, that uh, they're able to read. Uh, plus the fact that I in the primary grades, if the children are also seeing that their parents are very much engaged in the reading process and the schools are providing workshops for parents, to, to help them in this, uh, that's very motivating. A family literacy program connected with the school literacy program, I think is is uh, absolute must to, to continue to motivate the students so that they're motivated at home and at school. Can I Thank add you. something? Sure, Diane, that? really quickly. Um, I was going to say what's, what's very important is making sure that teachers scaffold whatever their, um, say, reading to children, to make sure that on an ongoing basis, children are questioned to make sure that they understand what is being read. A very effective strategy is, is storybook reading or reading expository text, but asking lots of questions on an ongoing basis to clarify misunderstandings. And this is also a very good way to build English proficiency because the teacher can, we were talking about errors before, the teacher can repeat what a child says but repeat it correctly, can elaborate on uh, students' responses. And this give and take around sort of the teacher reading t text to children is a very important way to build both content knowledge and oral language proficiency, but it requires very careful and thoughtful scaffolding. Lots of tips here and lots of new knowledge that's going to help us all. Now we're going to give you a little treat. It's a preview of the latest show in the Reading Rockets Launching Young Readers television series and will air on PBS stations around the country this spring and fall. It's a show just for kids who struggle with reading. Mariceli is a fifth grader at Maria Sanchez Elementary who struggled to read and speak English. Her school offered her the appropriate support. And with proper intervention and a little TLC, Mariceli learned to read and speak in English. Let's look. Today, we are going to see the secret lives of teenagers and how they get ready for a talent show. This is fifth grader Mariceli Ponton, Baton Rouge's sister. Man, I love this music. Marcelli lives in Hartford, Connecticut, but she was born in Puerto Rico. See the flag? This girl loves the spotlight, but that hasn't always been the case. I was reading in class, and then I came across this word that I didn't know in English. So when I started saying it, um, everybody started laughing. Yep. Marcelli had trouble learning to read. She was learning in a second language. Could you imagine learning to read Chinese or Greek? Mariceli and her family moved from Puerto Rico when she was just two years old. Mariceli's mom does speak a little English, but at home and in Mariceli's neighborhood, everyone usually speaks Spanish, which makes it hard to practice your English. It is hard to learn your English, especially when your family speaks Spanish only. I felt left out because I didn't know how to read or write English. And most of my friends, when they like pass notes around, they would pass me a note and they would write it in English. So when I was going to read it, I didn't know. One thing that confused Maricelli was the way the same sound can be spelled different ways. <laughs> What's that all about? You say a word like, for example, Christopher, right? It sounds like an F-E-R, but it's actually P-H-E-R. -P and that would be like, it's so hard. Things got so tough for Maricelli that they decided she needed to repeat the fifth grade. Ugh. I was mad. I didn't want, I was mad and sad. It was hard for me, so I wanted to quit. But then I decided not to. You go, Maricelli. A lot of kids would just give up, but not Maricelli. Say it, spell it, say it. Launching, L-U-N-C-H. She buckled down and worked extra hard with her teachers. The teachers always gave me, like, a book, and I started reading that one, and when I finished it, they told me to read it again, and they'll, they'll give me one book harder, and then one harder, and then they'll make me understand the English more. Maricelli also worked at home with her big sister, Bette Marie. Okay. It's hard, and it's at some points in time, you just feel like giving up, because maybe you think it's not worth it, but it's worth it everything, all the struggles, everything, it's going to be worth it. 
and Maricelli thinks so too. I wanted to show the bullies as they learn their second language, so good I learned my second language. And here I am talking English, and so can you. And guess what? Next year, she'll be headed to sixth grade, speaking and reading both English and Spanish. Did you know we have a website designed especially for Spanish-speaking parents and educators? ColorinColorado.org is a place where educators and teachers can find the best information for teaching English language learners to read. Call in now. The toll-free number is one eight 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 four nine three nine three eight two. Do you have a personal question you'd like to ask an expert about reading? Go to readingrockets.org and click on Ask Reading Rockets. Send us your question, and we will respond within a few days with a personal, confidential answer. Welcome back. We're now opening up the phone lines to take your calls, but first we'll hear from members of our studio audience. So let's go to the first question. How can educators motivate parents from other cultures who have had negative experiences themselves with the schools so that they can become involved in the educational process at home and at school? Ooh, a big question. Margarita? I'll, I'll start. Uh, some of the things I've, I've seen uh, in several schools and districts is that they have a variety of activities for parents. Some parents can only come in for breakfast meetings. Others can come in right after school to pick up the children and stay for a few minutes uh, where uh, the teachers or someone can be prepared to help them out, give them materials, do a little demonstration on how to listen to reading. Others can come in in evenings and uh, Saturday mornings. So where family um, literacy programs have worked is where they have a variety of things, not just one, and where the parents themselves are proposing uh, what, what can be done and how they themselves can collaborate with the schools. Uh, I was going to answer also briefly. Um, I think it's very important to provide professional development to school staff because I think that there are lots of parents who are eager and enthusiastic about getting involved in their children's education and they feel shut out. So I think schools need um, practice in welcoming parents. I saw a brilliant um, uh, project within a school in California, in fact, where, where the issue was precisely the one that you raised, how to uh, get the parents involved. And they took uh, a very uh, interesting approach, and that was they, they recognized the competencies that these parents had. And this happened to be a fairly large group of uh, people, Hmong uh, speakers from Southeast Asia, who, had, who were farmers in their uh, countries of origin, and they created a community garden where the teachers and the students and the parents uh, developed these gardens and then they integrated the gardens into their science and social studies lessons. Um, and it was a way of actually recognizing the competencies that the parents had and how they could actually contribute to the education of their children. It was brilliant. It worked very, very well. Well, this issue is a very international issue and we have a question now from Montreal, Canada. Thank you for taking my question. It's actually related to the former one, but um, uh, more extensive. Regarding awareness and training in teaching English language learners, Dr. Calderon described learning communities in school districts where principals are also involved. My question is, to what extent is this being done and indeed required elsewhere to involve not just the teachers and the families, but administrators, and school board members. How widespread is this? Well, I know that NCLB uh, has uh, set aside funding for staff development. Um, I think the focus has been too much on re retooling, retraining teachers rather than focusing on a whole school, a whole district, 
And that is something that I think even the Reading First um, initiatives and all the initiatives should look at setting aside different uh, staff development components, professional development components for administrators, for counselors, particularly at the secondary schools. Uh, everyone impacts the life and the education of an English language learner. And so those are the kinds of um, uh, components to a comprehensive staff development that uh, I think should be included. I'll jump in here. I know that in this country we also have a lot of the professional organizations uh, becoming engaged in instruction by having their membership uh, learn more about what happens in the schools and that would include PTA and it would include the uh, National Association of School Boards so it is a trend that I think we see beginning it's certainly not near as as well set up as we would like it but it's something that that's going to take on more interest as we move along and implementing good reading programs we have another question now from a studio the studio audience I would appreciate your thoughts on how I can get native English-speaking students to accept ELL students? Uh, well, one thing that, that I tried, actually this was my dissertation, was oh. to, um, and it did work, was to create, um, have pairs of children working together, English-only children and Spanish speakers. And I taught the Spanish-speaking children to do something. It was some kind of creative activity. And these children were like first to third grade. And then they had the responsibility of teaching the English-only student. So this was a way for the children to work together, but I sort of raised the status, in a sense, of the Spanish-speaking children. The, the other um, initiative that uh, is underway to address this kind of issue it are, are called two-way uh, immersion programs. So you may be familiar with them, but they're programs uh, where you have half of the students in the class are native English speakers and the other half are native speakers of another language. Often it's Spanish. And both of these students, uh, both of these groups of students are learning the other uh, group's language at the same time that they're learning to read and write and do all of the other things we do in school. And the, uh, these programs are very effective at actually breaking down some of the cultural barriers that, uh, uh, that exist in many schools. Right, it provides equal status to both languages and cultures. I've seen variations on this uh, at, that are less, uh, less extensive where uh, you take high school students who are interested in learning Spanish and they help Spanish-speaking students learn English and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of validating the competencies that both groups of students have and also it helps to break down these barriers. Let's go to New Jersey now. We have a question from there. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking my call. I actually have two questions. The first one, what do you suggest for students who arrive in middle school or high school and don't really have the opportunity to start from square one? Hit it, gang. <laughs> well, there, there have been newcomer programs established for these children, and some of them have been very successful. Um, these are programs that are either programs within a school or programs separate from the school. Generally, they're a year or two in duration. And the programs um, work to quickly develop students' English language and literacy proficiency. They, um, where possible, continue content instruction in the children's native language. They help children understand um, issues around cultural differences with regard to differences between their first, their, their native culture and English. So these programs have been very successful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, my second question is, what about students who don't have the opportunity to participate in a bilingual program to develop their native language reading skills? Then I would say um, an intensive immediate intervention in English reading uh, would, would, a hel would help. Uh, but that intensive uh, intervention probably has to um, be part of a secondary uh, program where the teachers who will be receiving the students right after this uh, intervention are also well trained in order to facilitate that, that transition into the mainstream classroom. 
So again, it, it takes quite a few teachers uh, beyond uh, uh, a newcomer or an, an intervention to facilitate the sustained achievement of a recently arrived ELL. There also are uh, instructional approaches which are designed to help students integrate into classrooms um, if they don't already know English uh, to a high level. And one of the ones that I think is particularly good is called sheltered instruction. And uh, it's an approach that helps teachers uh, present academic content uh, through the medium of English to students who are, all, are not proficient in English yet and at the same time they can present the content in a way that helps them a to acquire English. It's what Diane was referring to as scaffolding but there's actually a whole approach called sheltered instruction. Fred, you've brought your fan club today. We have a question from Cobet now. <laughs> yes, um, as you are well aware, our context in Quebec is uh, radically different from the one you've been describing. Uh, the majority language in Quebec is French, so I wondered if uh, you had any thoughts on teaching ESL in a context where English is not the language of the majority. Well, this is an interesting question because for um, uh, native French-speaking children in Quebec, they all are required to learn English as a second language, uh, but it's not the exactly the same situation as you point out in the US because these children can live and survive very comfortably within the context of uh, French in Quebec. Um, I think though that many, so I think that uh, Quebecers actually have the advantage that when you're teaching English as a second language to francophone students, they, you have the advantage that these students are already um, affirmed in who they are in their language. So they're in what we would call an additive bilingual situation. In other words, they can add English without any, any threat to their native French language skills. On the other hand, if we're talking about immigrant children, to Quebec who will go to French school and ultimately they also have to learn English as a second language, uh, then you're, you're really almost facing a situation that's almost a, a cross between a foreign language and second language. You really have many of the issues that you have in the U.S. These children are in a potentially subtractive bilingual situation. How do we teach them these other second languages uh, without loss of their native language. And I think many of the issues we've talked about today are really relevant to those children. But what we've talked about today is not so relevant to French children learning English in Quebec. Texas, we'd like to hear from you now. Texas on the line? Uh, yes, this, is, um, uh, this question is for Dr. Calderon. And I wanted to know how she um, has seen teachers teach first grade students learning to read for the first time in both English and Spanish simultaneously. Uh, I've seen it in um, classrooms where uh, team teachers, uh, where one teacher focuses on teaching English and the other one Spanish, and both languages are, are um, completely separate, separated. Uh, it, it actually starts in kindergarten and it goes up the grade levels, but it, it remains a 50-50 program all the way through the fifth grade. And uh, when uh, the languages are, are separated uh, for, for teaching reading, but eventually both languages come together. And in fact, uh, around the third, fourth, and fifth grades, uh, it turned out to be where the instruction was uh, one week in Spanish, one week in English, and then Spanish and English, Spanish and English. So that uh, equal time was uh, allocated to both languages. It seems to me I haven't had involvement. So we tend to actually, in the Canadian context, in other bilingual contexts, people often tend to keep literacy instruction in the two languages separate. Uh, in other words, there's a tendency to teach one language, reading in one language, before you introduce the other. But nevertheless, it seems to me if you're going to teach them simultaneously, you would want to keep them separate in other ways. It probably would be important to have different teachers teaching English versus those who are teaching Spanish. And also to, if you're using content, uh, to have different content associated with each of the languages so that the children aren't mixing up the sounds for the letters and so on. Diane, do you want to add anything no, for your I studies? Think, no, I think We have a question from our studio audience now. We have students with little or no schooling who are 11 and 12 years old. How do you teach them the basics like phonemic awareness? 
I'm sorry. Do you, how so, do you go ahead? Uh, there's very. I, I want to start off by saying there's extremely little. We're primarily researchers, or I'm primarily researchers, so I always address these issues from a research point of view. One of the huge gaps in the research area is really uh, these kinds of learners. Learners who come to uh, English language schools at, uh, in middle school or high school and they have no or very little uh, prior literacy instruction or little literacy experience. It does. Uh, the little bit that, it, that we do know though suggests that the same kinds of component skills um, and big picture skills that we've talked about that are important for young learners are probably important for older learners. But what you need to do is fast forward it. So it does seem that phonemic awareness instruction, um, building vocabulary and all those things are very important, even for older learners. Uh, but you wouldn't spend as much time on those skills as you would with young learners. Because young learners can be quite engaged in these kinds of activities for quite a long period of time. As you saw in the video, even listening to phonemes can be quite entertaining to an infant, but a, a 12 year old child or a d young adult isn't going to be very interested in that. So you have to find strategies for making these kinds of, um, uh, kinds of instruction interesting to children. With, with respect to phonemic awareness, there's all sorts of things you could do related to rap music, popular music that are highly relevant to the structure of language and the sounds of the language. And I think that with a little imagination, uh, teachers could draw on the culture of adolescence. Uh, to teach these kinds of language but skills. Use rap. But, <laughs> right? but I was going to add, I think you need to make sure that the children don't already have phonemic awareness when they're that age. I mean, I would advocate assessing phonemic right. awareness in their native language first because it's likely that that is not an issue for them. We've had so much to discuss today in, um, on this issue that is a growing challenge and opportunity in all our schools. Can each of you give me a final thought that you want to leave the audience with brief? Fred? Well, I will start. Uh, one, one of the, th the things that strikes me is that language is important in education, but there's more to education than language. Our job as educators is to educate these children completely, and one of the tasks is literacy, but it's not all there is. So we shouldn't be so focused on literacy that we sacrifice the other components of, of education. Brief final thought? Brief final thought. Extensive, comprehensive professional development programs. That says it all. And Diane? I would like to say that I think we undervalue the strengths and enthusiasm that children bring to the process of learning to read. I think it's very important that we nurture this in children and that we validate all that they do bring to classrooms and support them. All children can learn with the right support and care. Thank you, everyone. It's been wonderful. And thank you for participating in our 2003-2004 teleconference series, Achieving Success in Reading. If you'd like to comment on the series, please go to our website at readingrockets.org and click on Teleconference and complete the survey. Your input may guide future show topics and content used in the Reading Rockets teleconference series. Please stay in touch online at www.readingrockets.org to learn more about helping your struggling reader. Take care, everyone. For a copy of this program, our television series, Launching Young Readers, or our documentary, A Tale of Two Schools, please visit us at readingrockets.org or call 1-800-343-5540. The Reading Rockets teleconference series is a production of WETA in cooperation with the National Association of State Directors of Special Education, the National Education Association, the International Reading Association, and the National Association of Bilingual Education. Funding for this teleconference is provided by the United States Department of Education, Office of Special Education Programs.